let's imagine that we have a point here, we'll call it point P, a distance Y from the X axis. Let's imagine that we have a mass M here and a mass M here. Do we agree that both of these masses will provide a, gravita a gravitational field at that point? And we've already defined gravitational field to be the direction that a small point mass, we put a little bitty mass there, which way would it want to move? Well, wouldn't this one pull it this direction? And this one would pull it that direction. Do we agree that if these are equal distance from the y-axis, that the x components would cancel and the y components would happen? That should be pretty obvious, yes? So likewise, every mass, if we pick a pair of masses and they are equal distances, their x components would cancel and their y components would add. I pick another pair. Likewise, their x components would cancel, their y components would add. Are we all good with that? Other backyard information we hopefully remember from last time. If this distance from here to here is r, if this is x, and this is theta. We use basic right triangles. We know that r squared equals y squared plus x squared, or that r equals the square root of y squared plus x squared, and we write it this way, again, if you go back to the first derivation we did, with two point masses, which look just like this, you'll need that right there for the final derivation. We also, if we look here, we know that the cosine of theta equals adjacent over hypotenuse, and the sine of theta will equal opposite over hypotenuse, which would be x over r. Which one we use? Well, that would depend. Okay? That's our background information. Are we all good with that? Yes? All right. Next thing. We replace those two masses that we had, and I think I'm going to use all that space over there. So, we now have a bar of length L. Length L and mass M. And it's right on the y-axis. We again have our point P. And this, again, this will be L over 2, and this would be negative L over 2. And we're going to find the gravitational field due to this, this bar at point P. When we look at it, we should see, oh, it's made up of all of these little pieces of mass, isn't it? And just as before, we said we had a little mass here, a little mass here, a little mass here, and all of those will add together and give me the entire gravitational field. <coughs> so we take a look at this bar. Here's our x-axis here. And we pick a small piece of the bar, and we call it dm. And we're going to find the gravitational field due to that little dm. Why? Because we've learned that any thing that we are trying to find equals the, the summation or the integral of d something. The thing that we're looking for, if you find the d of it, the d something, the, the differential, you add them all up, you get the something. We've done that several times. Now, I'm going to show you something here using vectors. It turns out that if this is true, this also equals Would we agree with that? We have our, our components, yes? When we look at this, didn't we figure out that since there's equal on both sides, and if this one's going to pull down this direction, that's a terrible straight line, but it's fine, there will be an equal one on the other side. Do we agree with that? And we said that what cancels? The x components cancel, so we're going to do this. And we've now figured out explicitly that g is going to equal the summation of all of the dgy's. Well now I'm going to come over here and I'm going to kind of put together what we need. That's going to be my work, big workspace. We're learning a little bit of organization here. This is our big workspace. This is going to be our little workspace where we take our inventories and so forth. Okay. 
Well, we need to pick a we need to pick an angle. We'll call that one theta. If this is our little dg, then this would be dgx, and this would be dgy, and all of our x is equal zero. Well, is this one adjacent to the angle or opposite of the angle? It's adjacent, so therefore we're going to use Everybody comfortable with that? Because it's adjacent. <coughs> now, if little g equals big G m over r squared, but we're not working with an entire mass, are we? We're working with a little itty bitty mass. Mm -hmm. So, dg is going to equal big G dm over r squared. Agree with that? Plug that in. <clears throat> oh, but you know what? Let's start to look at how, how this, this M is going to move. Do we agree that this M is moving in what direction? It's moving in the X direction. And we're going to total up all these little DGs, or all these little DGs, from negative L over 2 to L over 2. So we need to get everything as a function of x. We can't add up a bunch of, do you, do you see how r is changing? That if this distance from here to here is r, do you agree that as I move out, r gets bigger? As I move in, r gets smaller. So r is a variable. Do we agree that theta is a variable? So we need to get everything as a function of x. Here we go. Well, remember we had a thing known as our linear line density. We talked again about we had a bar, and the bar is equal density. Then the density of the whole thing equals the same density as a piece of it, is the same density as an infinitesimally small. If I took a slice of this with a razor and I went, psh, it would have the same density. If I took a sliver off of this, I got it in my finger, wouldn't it have the same density as the whole thing? because it's all wood. So this is defined as the total mass divided by the total length. But if I change it to an infinitesimally small amount of it, it would equal dm over dl. And in our case, the little slices that we're taking are actually dx's. So now we're going to change it to dm over dx. You see that little dx right there? Okay, this right here would be the dx. So therefore, dm multiplied by dx over here equals lambda dx. Oh, look at that. We now have dm as a function of x. We're close. We got to get rid of the theta there, don't we? How about, uh, yeah, so isn't the cosine of theta, we did this earlier, equals, op, equals adjacent? over hypotenuse, which is r. Let's plug all that in. g equals big G dm, which we just found, lambda dx, over r squared times the cosine of theta, which is y over r. And that gives me integral big G lambda dx times y over r cubed. Are some of those constants? Big G is a constant. Does y stay constant? Yes? Does, does lambda stay constant? Yes. Yes. So now we take the constants out and we get g lambda y integral of dx over r cubed. Boy, we're so close. But doesn't r vary? R changes, right? Because it gets bigger over here and smaller over here. But remember a little while ago, we figured out what R was, didn't we? We said that R equals the square root of X squared, no, uh, yeah, X squared plus Y squared to the one half. And Y is a constant. So let's put it all in. G 
lambda y integral dx over x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves. Because 1 half times 1 half times 1 half gives me 3 halves. Now that we've got the setup, we did all of that to get little dg that we're going to integrate. But we're missing something. We're going to integrate from someplace to someplace. We could do this. We could go from negative L over 2 to positive L over 2, couldn't we? So would you agree that the both sides are symmetrical? They're equal? So if we just went from 0 to L over 2 and we doubled it, we would have the same thing. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to put a 0 here. I'm going to put an L over 2 here. And in front, I'm going to put a 2 because there are two sides of it. You might ask, why did I do that? Is this going to change the number? It will not change the number. You will get the exact same answer. It's just at the very end, when you put all these numbers into your integral, it's so nice to have a zero to just disappear, right? Because when you put zero in, lots of stuff just drops out, okay? Now, when we look at this, you might say, aha, I'm going to use the substitution method. And you would say, because if I let you equal x squared plus y squared, then du, oh, that's a, that's a constant, right? Disappears, would give me 2x dx. Do you see any two x's in there? Are there any two x's in there? I don't see any. Turns out that won't work. And what Tipler says in his book is he says, the answer to this is found in integration tables. And you would just go to the internet or you would go to a calculus book. You would look for that form, which would be x over x squared plus something to the 3 halves. And you would write the answer down. You say, well, why do we do this if we're not going to do any more calculus? We just did the physics. The next step, apparently the third year calc kids can do, and some of the second year calc kids at the end of the second year. You're not responsible for that. But it has happened on the AP tests before where they've said, set up, but do not solve. And you could go ahead and do that. Okay, stop.